Good day, everyone. I am Trevor Hassel, president of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition's second youth-focused webinar titled The Future Talks, COVID-19 and NCDs in the Caribbean Legacy. In today's webinar, we are aiming to provide insight from youth experts on their professional and personal perspectives on how the region's health systems can build back better from the COVID-19 experience. During the webinar, you'll hear from young experts from Latin America and the Caribbean and beyond who will share their views on the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on patient management, nutrition and mental health services, and they'll provide insight into the changes needed to better address the health of key populations and protect people living with NCDs. The reality is the youth are important agents of meaningful action and positive change. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown this to be particularly true as many young people have contributed and continue to significantly contribute to counteracting the adverse health consequences of the pandemic. As we seek to build back better post the COVID-19 pandemic, it is today's youth that will be the major beneficiaries of the world. They should therefore have a voice in what that world should look like at all levels including policy determinations. It is with those very few introductory remarks on behalf of the directors of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition that I now invite our outstanding youth leaders and champions, two of them that is, Daniel Walwyn and Pierre Cook Jr. to co-chair the webinar. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Prof, for those opening remarks. So my name is Daniel Walwyn, and I am the Advocacy Officer at the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, and I am co-moderating with Mr. Pierre Kirk, the HCC's Youth Voices Technical Advisor. And we are so thrilled to be moderating today's webinar, a space where youth experts can share their personal and professional perspectives on how we can build back better as a region. The youth voice is critical and should be a guiding force in all conversations addressing concerns of this generation and those to come. As mentioned during our last webinar, giving youth a voice goes far beyond the invitation. It is allowing them to be active agents of change in shaping a society. As passionate advocates, they should be centrally involved as the designers and drivers of local, regional, and global action for the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. By aiming to build back better, we acknowledge that there are gaps in the current NCD response. The pandemic has effectively exposed the gaps on our healthcare system and the vulnerabilities of people living with NCDs. A multi-sectoral, whole of society approach needs to be used to address the gaps in our healthcare systems and create sustainable change. If implemented effectively, these responses can have equitable outcomes and bring us closer to achieving the sustainable development goals. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so in thinking about sustainable change, uh, we also need to shift our attention away from dealing with these issues in silos and strategize on how we can address society's concerns using a multi-pronged approach. For example, uh, addressing two defining challenges of the 21st century, climate change and NCDs, the resources injected into the health of our environment and its sustainability can also improve our health systems. Now, time and time again, our youth have demonstrated their ability to think outside of the box and collaborate on solving our region's problems, especially in supporting the most vulnerable. Now today, our presenters are a reflection of some of the major pieces of the puzzle that need to be filled to bridge the gaps, and they will share their passions, perspectives, and guidance on the change that we have to consider to ensure that no one is left behind in the building map process. I am excited to introduce to you today our esteemed panelists. And first we have Edith, 
who is a nutritionist and a One Young World ambassador and most excitingly, a Lee 2030 Challenge winner. Uh, now in 2016, Edith co-founded Create Purpose Mexico, an organization that provides sustainable programs to support children's need for a practical education so that they can thrive in the real world. Now, Edith has been recognized with Best Social Service Experience by the Universidad Iberoamericana Valuable Citizen Award by Kibernis. And in 2019, she was an AstraZeneca Young Health Program Scholar, and she became a One Young World Ambassador. Now, Edith is gonna to speak to us just for a bit. Thank you so much, Piet, for that introduction. I am so happy to be here. And as you said, happy to be the 2030 Challenge winner for, for this year um, with my other peers who are also winner for this year. Um, thank you, thank you. And we're going to be talking about nutrition and, and food, of course, and health in, in the youth. Um, I put this quote here because we really believe this in Create Purpose, that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Uh, we've been using this, this quote since Create Purpose started, the organization that I lead. Um, and in the last few days, I've seen it coming up recently in our social media um, with the celebration of Nelson Mandela, of course. And um, I just want you to keep this in mind during the next 10 minutes because you're going to, to know why I put this here. Next slide, please. So Create Purpose is a binational organization. We work in Mexico in the border um, with the United States. So we're, we have presence in both sides of the border. And we focus in, in two main uh, sustainable development goals. Our programs uh, focus in these two when we talk about the prevention of non-communicable diseases and in the creation of opportunities for orphan and vulnerable children that live in institutions, um, which is our main population that we serve um, we have here our mission as Create Purpose in just a little bit more, um, more uh, pretty words, but really is that all we do. We work in the, in the promotion of health, in the promotion of well-being, and in the creation of opportunities for those who have been left behind for generations. Children that live in orphanage face many, many challenges. Uh, within those challenges, there are um, um, they are behind in their development and, and lack opportunities because of that. Um, they're behind uh, psychologically, academically, emotionally, socially, and that's why we focus in this main um, two sustainable development goals, number three and number four. And we also work in a horizontal way in our other um, programs with gender equality, of course, with the creation of equal opportunities for all, um, with the creation of peace within our communities. And we know that those alliances are needed to create that. So we go into the next slide. Um, this is just the numbers that UNICEF um, just put out very recently, this last week uh, for Mexico, but it is, it is definitely similar to the Caribbean. So it applies to, to all of our um, communities. So this is the situation of the children in Mexico, uh, having almost 40 million of children and adolescents in my country and seeing how almost 36% of them between five and 11 years old suffer obesity and overweight in our country. This is a major problem that, as I said, not only Mexico is facing, but also Latin America, the Caribbean itself. Um, that's why we work with SDG number three, health and well-being, and we'll talk about that more in the next few slides. And we also work with the SDG number four education, uh, quality education for all, because 80% of children in elementary school won't reach the learning expected for the educational level. 80% of them, this is just major, major problems here in Mexico. Um, and that's why we say education is this most powerful tool, because if we talk about health, if we talk about gender equality, if we talk about peace, or whatever we want to talk about, we need to focus first on what are our children learning um, or not learning even, that is even worse. Um, Here's some other statistics. And what, when we're talking about type of violence at home, some type of violence that they have experienced, how it impacts in the trauma 
and later in their mental health, of course, even in their physical health and their ability to learn at school. Um, then we talk about um, development level, which is what, what I was talking about, children that are institutionalized, which are the, the children and youth that I work with the most, um, are seeing this uh, delay in their development or inability to develop fully because of the trauma that they've lived in. And of course, when we talk about poverty, almost 50% of our children and adolescents living in poverty, how that presents a major barrier in their development and future well-being. So are you going to the next slide, please? So really, what are we doing at Create Purpose to face these challenges that are happening and mostly with COVID-19? Um, in Create Purpose, we have uh, four different programs. Two of them work directly with the youth and with the children. One of them is through technology and the other one, the other one is through the garden, um, learning from the garden. Both of them use these tools or these projects as the learning experiences to really develop the other abilities that we need as humans, really. Um, in the development of our collaboration, our ability to collaborate with others as a society, uh, to express ourselves, to be reflective and so, um, to learn in our own, to, be, uh, to have self-worth skills, of course, and creativity, logical, mathematical thinking, um, our ability to think in an abstract way, of course, and all these beautiful things um, that we work on. Yes, we work in promoting nutrition and health and well-being. Um, and we also, when we talk about well-being and we talk, when we talk about health, we need to talk about social emotional skills and because we are social beings. And so how we relate with others is really something that matters um, when we talk about children and their development. And as we go into the next slide, you will see how we, we also work with the adults that care for these children. Because of course, we want these children and teenagers to have the abilities and, and the tools to be able to um, go on their own in their lives once they turn 18 and how we're working with them. But also, if we can go into the next slide, um, we cannot do that on our own. As, as teenagers or as children, they cannot do that on their own, really. We need the, the adults that are around them so we work with their caretakers, with the directors of the orphanages or the homes that are um, the home to these children where they live. And we work with them in childcare, new development, well-being and nutrition and health, of course. So we can give these adults the tools that they need because we know that children and teenagers are going to be learning from them. They're going to be simulating that. Uh, what they're doing. If they're eating vegetables, then the children are, of course, going to be eating vegetables because they have the power to decide what the children are going to be eating, what the children are going to be learning, and what they're even going to be listening to, what conversations. And that is going to have a major impact on their health. That's why we, we do this. If we go into the next one, um, we know we, um, that in order to empower the youth, we need to give them the ability to make their own decisions. Really, we cannot go into any teenager and tell them what to do. We know that. And so why are we just going and giving them talks? Why are we just telling them what they should do? We need to give them the opportunity to make decisions for themselves. And our garden program really goes into this directly. Um, and this is why we're doing it, just going hands-on learning. Uh, this is how we empower the youth right now. And even during COVID-19, um, when we're going in, transitioning into the digital world, we're looking for ways to do this. And I'm going to talk about that. I can talk about that in the Q&A. If we go into the next slide, of course. We have a power. We have the power as a society to change our reality. That is just the truth. So I am just going to invite you with this slide to work in whatever way you can to create a change when we talk about health and nutrition and equality and all these beautiful things that we're talking about. We go into the next slide, please. And yes, me uh, being a, a youth health advocate as I am learning that I am or that I am becoming and I didn't even realize a few days ago, 
Um, yes, it is going there and being in the ground and getting our hands dirty and working with the children and with the te teenagers one-on-one. -on -one. That is definitely the thing that we need to start doing, going into the communities and working and getting dirty. Yes, of course. And as we go into the next slide, please, um, we also need to be doing this. We also need to be putting ourselves out there, especially in these times when we're all looking at our screens and just telling the world what we're doing so everyone can get inspired to do something in their communities and we can really create change together. If no one knows what we're doing, it's very hard that they're going to be listening to what we're saying. And just to finish um, with the next slide, I want to thank you all for, for being here and for the opportunity. And I will be happy to respond to all of your questions because we have very limited time. Thank you. No, thank you very much, A.D., for that uh, wonderful presentation. And I think you um, highlighted some very important points, uh, the fact that we as youth have the power and we as a society have the power to fight for that change and change our realities. And it's up to us to ensure that there is that process and we do go through that mode of ensuring that children and youth are protected um, and they have access to equitable health care. Um, and Jan uh, Margianta, who's our next uh, presenter, is going to come to us in just a bit and speak about how we can protect our children and protect our youth, especially within the tobacco space. Now, in 2015, Margianta became the co-initiator and spokesperson for the youth movement for FCTC, and he was focusing on tobacco control for and by youth from a glo global health perspective. Now, his movement has gained thousands of petitions and letters with hundreds of creative campaigns all over Indonesia to support Indonesian tobacco control policies. Now, I'm just going to let you have it <laughs> from Jian, and we'll have some conversations in the question and answer section. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Thank you very much, Healthy Caribbean, for the opportunity. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Margianta Surahman Juhanda Dinata. Uh, people usually just call me Gian or, or Giant. Uh, I don't really mind either. But what I really mind is for us to really um, focus on what we can do, uh, not only as individuals, but as a collective, as a, as a uh, certain groups of people with a certain age, which is now as we classified as young people to beat NCDs, to beat non-communicable disease, but, but basically my main focus uh, all of this time has been on tobacco control. My title for tonight is actually Youth Versus Tobacco, How David uh, Beats Goliath in Indonesia. Maybe some of you know about the story of David versus Goliath when, when David was able to beat Goliath, uh, you know, a giant uh, with limited resources. So that is actually how I see young people not only in Indonesia, but all across the world who can advocate and campaign against tobacco industries. They are actively targeting young people as their customers. So next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So um, how big tobacco, oh, sorry, previous slide. I think my, my, my sound is a bit, uh, yeah. So how big tobacco sees Indonesian youth? Basically, um, they see us, of course, as targets. We are profits in their report. They are just numbers and we are the pawns in their games because they, sometimes they pit us against each other, you know? Those who are cool and smoking, who goes to concerts, they are sponsored by big tobacco, etc., and those who doesn't. So they try to divide the voices of young people. So, and as here, I just quoted one of many thousands of documents, internal documents from tobacco industries proving that they are actively targeting young people to be their customers. Here it says younger adult smokers are younger adult smokers are the only source of replacement smokers. If younger adults turn away from smoking, the industry must decline. So there is no other way for the tobacco industry to survive other than to target young people as their uh, as their customers. Next slide, please. So um, if we see, um, this is very worrying. If I'm talking about Indonesia, and we're talking about the child smokers, which is a ticking bomb in my country, Indonesia, um, where in many countries, the trends of child smokers have been decreasing. In Indonesia, it has been increasing. We have now 7.8 million 
child smokers who are actively smoking from the age of 10 until 18 years old. This is very worrying at the rate of 9.1%. This is equals to 104 times uh, of all Trafford Stadium. Can you imagine that? And it's the entire Hong Kong population. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not proud of saying this. This is very much um, worrying, but this is the reality in Indonesia. Uh, many yeah, child, child, children are also um, passive smokers and, and, main, and set, uh, almost uh, three out of four men in Indonesia also smoke. So it has something to do with gender construction as well. If you smoke, you're not manly enough, etc. So they have so many uh, ways of trying to lure uh, children and young people into smoking. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, if we see how they target young people in Indonesia, uh, we are talking also about how they promote their products in the social media, how they offer also vape and e-cigarettes as, you know, healthier alternative, but they are just another form of addiction. They sponsor um, athletes, little athletes, children athletes with their brand image on it. It's child exploitation. They, they put their advertisement around schools. They even advertise in the middle of pandemic endorsed by influencers who has millions of followers selling their products. Even now we see also in Netflix and everywhere, uh, you know, this, uh, this unnecessary smoking scenes are everywhere. So we are being targeted everywhere by the multinational tobacco companies but, and also by the national tobacco companies in our countries. This is very worrisome and we need to stop this. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what have we done in my movement? Um, so we have done a campaign, research, advocacy, because we know that the voices of adolescent children and young people actually are ne um, quite neglected, but especially adolescent uh, youth. We are very much neglected, less research on us about NCDs. And even though recently we have so many reports coming in, but that is, that is just recently before there has no been a specific attention, to, either it's based on data, based on campaign or advocacy, even let alone to let us actively participating in this space to advocate for our own health. We don't have the space. Even I got discriminated when I became a tobacco control advocate. They said like, what are you doing? You're, you're still young, you're adolescent, etc. What do you have in mind? And, and this is what we have in mind. We have advanced our advocacy. And in, in the next slide, please, if we see in the next slide, we have done a lot of things. One of them is also we gathered thousands of petitions. Um, and those petitions actually enforce the um, uh, national governments, uh, local governments to do more and committed to protect young people from cigarettes. We even managed to make the president make the first ever cabinet meeting on framework conventions on tobacco control in 2016, just because we gathered 11,000 letters from all across Indonesia. So uh, this was seen impossible, you know, they said like, oh, you know, your methodologies are, are, you know, are questionable. You are young people. What kind of data can you produce? But here it is, right? We managed to pull this through. Uh, actually, we managed to, to influence not only local governments, but also national governments to enforce more tobacco control measures. So those people who are doubting us in the beginning as adolescents, as young people, to participate more actively in research, in campaigning, in advocacy, to beat NCDs to, and, and also to enforce tobacco control, you know, they're not seen anywhere when we had our success. So we prove, actually, we prove that we can be the David that if, it, if it's Goliath, we have all the innovations and everything. Uh, next slide, please. So maybe I will just uh, play this video to close my uh, presentations. This is a glimpse uh, from my, um, present, uh, my speech in One Young World with Terry Crews, the Hollywood actor. Okay, please play the video. I would love to introduce you to Margianta, my man. He's the youngest speaker at the Asian Pacific Conference on Tobacco. His message is that young people need to say no to tobacco, for real. And I totally agree. And 70% of the men in Indonesia uh, view smoking as a very, a male, thing to do as as the thing to do and you were actually on the 
you're actually not right. This young man has really taken it upon himself in a climate that is against him to really, really change his world for the better. Please, everyone, Margianta. One of the challenges in Indonesia has been the tobacco industry's propaganda. The tobacco industry in Indonesia spends a lot of money on advertisement and promotion that targets young people in public places. The tobacco industry gives scholarships to students and athletes and even organizes concerts and movie productions to target young people. Young people deserve to inherit a healthy world. We will continue to expose the tobacco industry for its wrongdoings. We will continue to push the government for greater tobacco control. And we will continue to fight for the well-being of young people. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, I think that was my slide. So we need meaningful youth participation, not only in tobacco control, but also in other NCDs issues. I would love to answer your questions in the chats and um, end the session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, powerful presentation. Um, and so far, I'm really happy by the conversation that we've been having um, about health, about youth, and especially looking at it through this post or during the pandemic lens. Um, and I think, Jan, you, you clearly brought out that as youth advocates, as young people within this space, it can be very difficult and challenging and taxing on us to have to go through and face the discrimination, to face the backlash, and especially when we're going up against these big organizations like Big Tobacco. Um, and within this space, and during COVID-19, we recognize the importance of protecting and ensuring that young people uh, have resources to deal with mental health and deal with their mental health issues. And, and our next presenter will just give us a bit um, of insight on that. And we have Ms. Tara Amor. Now, Tara, is a psychosocial advisor who has worked in criminal justice and humanitarian organizations around the world. Now she holds a bachelor in science and psychology, a master in science in forensic mental health, and is currently in training as a clinical psychologist. Now Tara's passion is to use what she has learned as a traveler and a psychologist to positively impact the Caribbean society. And we know today we really need that conversation about mental health in the Caribbean. Tara? Thank you, Pierre, for the kind introduction, and thank you to everyone for joining this conversation, which I think is very important, particularly from a youth perspective. So we don't have much time, I'm going to get right into it. I'd like to start by talking about some of the realities of mental health in the Caribbean from my personal experience. Unfortunately, there remains pervasive stigma surrounding mental illness and a lack of awareness about when, what mental illness actually is and how it may manifest in different individuals. Many people in the Caribbean still think that to be mentally ill is to be crazy or psycho. And I personally advocate against using terms like this to describe persons who are mentally ill. Much like non-communicable diseases, mental illness can be considered an invisible illness in that you often would not know interacting with someone what symptoms they may be currently experiencing or what their history of mental illness or their family history of mental illness may be. And unfortunately, there is still a lack of resources, particularly around psychological services within the Caribbean. I will say that I've seen an increase in raising awareness around the importance of mental health, which I'm very happy to see, but we still need to advocate for greater access to and understanding of what these resources can provide. And I'd very likely quickly like to touch on the the difference between psychology and psychiatry, which is that as a psychologist, my job would be to interact with individuals one-on-one -on -one or in a group therapy session to help them collaboratively identify their personal history and how that may con contribute to 
presentation of symptoms of mental illness, whereas a psychiatrist uses these symptoms to help identify the best medical treatment that they can provide. It's important for psychologists and psychiatrists to work together. However, in the Caribbean, many of the health industries, health, um, sorry, the health ministries are regulating for psychiatric services more so than psychological services. So I'd like to advocate for a combination of the two. Now, the impact of COVID-19 on mental health is particularly important to discuss in this time. Unfortunately, many of the realities that we're facing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic are considered to be stressors or triggers for mental health symptoms. So pervasive stress and uncertainty can be hugely detrimental to one's mental health and usually contribute to the onset of symptoms of mental illness. In addition, financial strain and the economic burden that our countries and citizens are seeing because of losing jobs and having to close borders is also considered a trigger for mental illness. In addition to that, the isolation that has become necessary because of the physical measures put in place, in place to protect our health is also detrimental to mental health in that, as Edith pointed out, we are social beings and the more isolated we are, the more unhappy we are likely to, to be. This can lead to increase in suicidal ideation and other adverse mental health symptoms. In addition, the lack of exercise and importance of nutrition is something that needs to be emphasized in this time because we are not getting much time to go outside, be physically active, spend time outdoors, and that's very important for maintenance of mental health. And as the Healthy Caribbean Coalition can attest, nutrition is also incredibly important for overall health and well-being. Furthermore, the switch to online working and online schooling has blurred the boundaries between what we can set up for ourselves in our own space to be self, to prioritize self-care versus what we have to do and the demands put on us for working or schooling from home. And lastly, anyone suffering from pre-existing conditions, be them physical or mental conditions, are rightfully concerned about their access to and the safety surrounding their access to necessary healthcare services. So to touch on the importance of mental health in a youth population, many people may not know that many mental disorders begin to show symptoms prior to the age of 14 years old, which is very young, but often these symptoms go undetected or untreated until later in life. This can be because detecting symptoms can often be difficult, particularly in an adolescent population, and many people may not know how to identify the symptoms of a mental illness. For example, most people wouldn't know that risk-taking behaviors such as increased drinking or reckless driving or endangering yourself or others could be a symptom of major depressive disorder and could just be a cry for help. These, the onset of mental illness in a youth population will have lasting impacts on their continued development and functioning into adulthood. Furthermore, the impact of, of illnesses such as depression, anxiety, social withdrawal and others will negatively impact academic functioning, which as we all know, can negatively impact continued development and functioning into adulthood. Most people would not know that 60% of global suicide attempts occur before the age of 25 years old. And this is particularly important in a Caribbean context where in my home country of Trinidad, we see a spike in suicidal behavior around the age of 11 and 12 when children are studying for and feeling a lot of pressure surrounding the SEA exams. Furthermore, many adolescents and many people in general turn to substances such as alcohol and marijuana to cope when they are feeling adverse mental health. And these can be particularly detrimental in a youth population where the brain is not yet fully developed and many people don't understand the lasting impact that dabbling in these substances at an early age can have for the rest of their life. Lastly, it's particularly important to discuss the home environment and any experience of community violence that children may be facing in our Caribbean communities. Feeling isolated and being forced to do school from home can have detrimental impacts in that if a child is looking forward to leaving the house and going to school for some reprieve from either an adverse home environment or feeling unsafe in their own community, having that denied to them now that they're forced to stay at home does have very serious implications for mental health and onset of mental illness. 
So the transition to online schooling has understandably brought, a lot, brought about a lot of stress and an experience of isolation and loneliness. So looking forward, some of the implications of the pandemic that we are currently experiencing, I believe we will see an onset of pandemic related mental illnesses. This will involve increased symptoms of illnesses such as obsessive compulsive disorder, health anxiety, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety, and it's also very important to consider the risks associated with prolonged exposure to stress and isolation as I've already identified. I also already spoke about the healthcare access and concerns that particularly persons living with non-communicable diseases will have surrounding the safety of their access to healthcare and the necessity of this access. And I think for people living with non-communicable diseases and for everyone interacting with the healthcare services at this present time, we need to prioritize assessment of and treatment of mental health concerns. Um, in the initiative to build back better, young people are the future of our societies. So investing in mental health for young people today is an investment in our collective futures. And the only way to build back better is to include youth voices in the policy discussions regarding their futures. Now, some of the policy recommendations that I can make from my personal experiences would be to incorporate psychoeducation and programs aimed at raising awareness and encouraging participation in physical activities so that the link between physical exercise and mental health can be better understood. We also should advocate for campaigns aimed at decreasing stigma around mental illness and increasing empathy in interacting with persons with mental illness. This would serve to improve community effectiveness in helping support and provide treatment for people suffering from mental illness so that we don't only treat them at the psychiatric or psychological stage. We also need to increase availability of access to and affordability of psychological and wellness services rather than only psychiatric services at a ministry level. Mental health should be treated as a priority rather than a luxury, particularly going forward. I would recommend that health ministries incorporate mental health services into projected budgets in order to ensure that services can be available as needed and not just when symptoms become so acute that they require hospitalization. Furthermore, I think it's important to examine a multidisciplinary approach to, to tackling mental illness and providing services for mental illness. A mental illness cannot be diagnosed unless it is causing severe clinical functioning, functional impairment in occupational, social, or academic spheres of life. And therefore, the best way to provide preventative measures would be to incorporate mental health education and services in these different domains. I think it's also worth noting that a multinational approach can be particularly effective because in my work throughout the Caribbean, I have seen many different approaches from many different health ministries surrounding the approach to mental illness and the raising of awareness. And so we can learn from each other and adapt what one country is doing in their ministry to what would work best in our country. I'm going to try to rush through the rest of this because I know that I'm short on time. Um, some personal recommendations that I would provide is to stay active, make sure that you're getting as much fitness in as you can, and this can be done through online yoga classes or Zumba classes. I would also recommend finding support. There is comfort in community. I read a, a quote recently that says, we are not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm, and I think that's particularly important to understand right now. I'd advise that you make time to check in with yourself, prioritize self-reflection, and try to identify how you're feeling and what is triggering those feelings so that you can identify ways to improve your circumstances. And lastly, educate yourself. Avoid misinformation. Try to dedicate some time to reading the news and fact-checking your sources throughout the day and dedicate equal, if not more time, to self-reflection and self-soothing. Thank you very much. I have included a lot more information within my slides, which I have been told will be made available to you. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Tara, for a very um, comprehensive, I should say, conversation and presentation on uh, mental health in the Caribbean. Um, brilliant. I think some of those statistics and data are really compelling. And if we can get that type of message up to our governments and up at the higher level, hopefully it can drive the change that we wish to see. 
Um, so I'm just going to remind everyone that you can use our question and answer box to feed your questions into our uh, presenters and they may answer you um, during the session and we have a question and answer section at the end um, that we will field those questions again. Um, and I'm just going to go into our next presenter. Now, especially we have with us um, Kedi Moyes, who's a physician and head of clinical operations at Fondation Haitienne de Diabète et de Maladies Cardiovasculaires. And he is an advocate for social justice in healthcare um, in Haiti. And he uses his position to raise awareness about chronic disease in the community and to help build health programs that are accessible to the most vulnerable. Uh, he is currently working towards establishing a coordination network between all key stakeholders involved in the management of diabetes in Haiti to define a national plan. Now, Kelly is going to share just a bit about the experience in Haiti. Thank you, Pierre, for this introduction. I'm glad to be here this morning uh, to share the, um, the perspective of Haiti in prioritizing people living with um, non-communicable disease during COVID and what we can do in the future to keep this prioritization. Next slide, please. Since before the pandemic, we have some challenges in the healthcare system. Uh, we can say that it was, uh, it is still a weak health system with low health literacy in the general population. And we have what we call the fragmentation of care. Like um, people living with non-communicable disease will go from specialist to specialist, but there is not an integrated approach when someone can go in only one place and have all the care that he needs. And we have a high proportion of undiagnosed and underserved um, a high proportion of people living with NCD that do not know that they have this disease. A lot of focus have been placed on um, clinic care, but in the general sense, we, we don't have a lot of familiarity with emergency preparedness. That's why the system was not resilient enough for a crisis like the COVID-19. And during this crisis, we, um, we saw low cleaning attendance because of major disruption in transportation and, um, and the policies implemented by the government. And, and even before that, we, have, we had a lot of fear and misinformation about COVID-19, about NCDs and the outcome of people living with NCDs when they have COVID-19. All this put together, they, um, they result in low attendance in clinics. And um, because we have a lot of disruption in transportation and supply chain, in clinics, we have a lot of a shortage of essential medicines for hypertension and other chronic diseases. Next slide. But we did something to, um, to overcome those challenges. First, in the beginning of the pandemic, we uh, run a broad information campaign about epidemic preparedness. Uh, and we, we worked on protocol inside our clinics to reduce the risk of contracting infectious diseases. And we worked on um, accurate information for physicians and other health professionals to manage diabetes during the COVID-19 crisis. All this we work together, in all this we work together with our local partners who also work with people with NCDs. And we have uh, scientific sessions with other um, healthcare professionals throughout the country. And the most important thing is that we, we build a community approach to maintain the supply chain of essential medicine uh, for the population. 
we will go into all this in the upcoming slides. Next, please. In the information campaign that we had in the beginning of the pandemic, we, we put the focus on basic hygiene and the rules for sick days for the people living with NCDs, uh, for them to know what to do, how to take the medicines and where to go and what to um, expect. Next. And inside our clinics, we made sure that everyone would get in, fill out a questionnaire and have their temperature checked. We had hand sanitizers inside and mandatory face mask for everyone. We, we put all those rules because we want to, we need to make sure that everyone, um, everyone coming inside our clinics are safe during the stay. And we made, we made also sure that every health worker had proper PPE. Next. In the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of confusion about how to respond to, um, how to manage diabetes during the, um, during the crisis. If the patient has diabetes and COVID-19, how to properly take care of them. Um, a lot of health professionals were confused. Patients were confused. So we worked on a position statement to, um, to uh, highlight the key points, how to change the medication, what works best, and uh, the proper care to give to uh, those vulnerable people. And all this, we worked with, in all this, we worked with the Association of Private Hospitals and the College of Internal Medicine to make sure that every physician know what to do. Next. And finally, we built a community project. We trained youth, young people to go to the community and to deliver the essential medicine to the most uh, to the most vulnerable people and the, um, the most vulnerable people and those who present the most risk. So we give them insulin, glucose testing strips and glucometers to maintain the, um, to maintain a kind of normal care. Next. That's what we do during this pandemic. But um, after all this, now we are, in the, we are in a stage where we are going out of the crisis. I think we should uh, continue to maintain all that we did and we had success in doing so. So actually for the future, I think we need to um, strengthen our healthcare system to make it more resilient to disaster and emergency. And we need to insist on the central role of the primary care physician and to work on prevention. And in working in the centrality of the primary care physician, we will diminish the fragmentation of care that will be benefit for the system and benefit for the patient also. Next. And on the government level, I think um, we should focus on universal health coverage for all and building, building resilient health, uh, a resilient health system and resilient supply chain of essential medication for all. And actually it's not Telemedicine, it's not well established everywhere, but I think it's something we should consider for the future. That's what our perspective uh, about how to prioritize people living with NCDs during this crisis and what we think uh, that should be done in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kedi, uh, for your presentation, especially 
just sharing with us uh, that very real experience um, in Haiti. Um, I think you particularly underscored an important thing that I think all of us appreciate on this webinar that persons living with NCDs are indeed vulnerable and they're exposed to even more vulnerabilities during pandemics, uh, emergency crises and other situations. Now, our next presenter has some experience with uh, living and being a part of family with a person, persons living with NCDs. Now, Eden has degrees in culinary education, human nutrition, and dietetics, and public health. And she has spent years using her skills, both personal and career-oriented, to help her clients lead healthier lifestyles by providing them with nutritional and culinary support. As the daughter and granddaughter of persons living with, with diabetes, she understands the interplay between diet and health. And she will have a conversation right now about the importance of research and the power of research in this time of COVID and beyond. Okay, thank you for the outstanding introduction. So good morning to all those logged in. We are going to look at why research is important, some findings particularly focused on youth and people living with NCDs, research successes and challenges, and how research can help build back better. Next slide, please. Okay, so we want to ask ourselves two questions. What is research and why is research important? So research has been defined as the systematic investigation undertaken to increase knowledge by studying and utilizing different material and sources. But the importance of research lies in its ability to establish facts or generate new conclusions. Next slide, please. Research can prove to be particularly important during crisis. So we can examine this in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Without research, the virus pathology and epidemiology will be unknown. There will be no contact tracing. We will be unsure of how the virus is spread, unsure of the populations that are at greater risk, and unsure of health and other implications of COVID-19. Most importantly, Without research, we would be unable to control the spread of the virus, treat those who have already contracted the virus, and find preventative and curative measures. Next slide, please. So I was fortunate to be a part of research teams that focused on some of these aspects previously mentioned. Um, one of the teams conducted a COVID-19 Barbados KABP study. So this study ran from April 23rd to May 6th and focused on the knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and practices that Barbadians shared towards COVID and its related implications and restrictions. So generally, the sample seemed to conform to the non-pharmaceutical interventions that were put in place. For example, 92% of the sample were using hand sanitizer and wearing masks, while 98% upkept hand washing practices and 75% avoided public trans um, transportation. It was interesting to find that almost 78% of the population were generally worried about the coronavirus. However, only 10% actually thought that they would be infected. So the majority actually felt safe with the implemented interventions. More than a third of the population reported losing their job or business related to COVID, while more than a third of those who actually retained their job was not equipped to work from home. In addition, results of the hospital anxiety and depression scales show that more than 96% of the sample reported clinically significant depression symptoms and about 87% reported clinically significant anxiety symptoms. Next slide, please. So as seen in this table, our findings showed some specific implications on youth. The categorization of age revealed that more than a quarter of the sample was 20 to 30 years old and 46% of the sample were under 35. There were 186 students within the sample of which 97% were under 35. However, approximately one fifth of the students were not equipped to study from home. Of the 121 persons who actually reported drinking more during the restrictions and lockdowns, almost half were under 35. 
In addition, um, more than half of these, um, of those under 35 reported losing their jobs. I believe it is also important to know that persons who are under the age of 35 reported the highest severe um, depression symptoms. And this actually confirms the point that was um, raised by Tara. Other findings highlighted that marijuana and drug use, such as the use of cocaine, had the highest increase among those under 30. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, our studies did not ask some specific question for those living with NCDs. However, through my own research using WHO and PAHO websites, I found that there were negative effects of health system restrictions globally for those living with NCDs, especially in lower income countries. So many people who needed treatment did not receive the health services and medicines they needed since the pandemic began. This is particularly concerning since they have a higher risk of severe COVID-19 related illness and death. In addition, some implications of the physical and travel restrictions included limited physical activity and lower access to healthy and fresh foods. Therefore, with the implementation of policies, consideration must be given to those living with NCDs. And if we are truly an open and caring society, consideration must be given to people living with HIV and other chronic diseases. Next slide, please. For research to be truly successful, it is important to have support and this can be internally and externally. So during the pandemic and keeping within the restrictions, a lot of research may be done online or via telephone. So for recruitment purposes, it is important to have support from groups that can reach the target audience. It is also important to collaborate, though there may be measures um, put in place for both internal and external collaboration. Our research culture within the Caribbean is not one which fosters collaboration across sectors with unfamiliar groups. So it is important for us to remember and to keep in mind that research is more impactful with multi-sectoral collaboration. Next slide, please. So I believe the two major research challenges are communication and securing funding. With regards to communication, it is important for persons to allow others to be aware of ongoing research because this can increase collaboration, time with the point from before, as well as reduce repetitive efforts. There is also a need for more public and private sector funding for healthcare research in Barbados and the wider Caribbean. Research in the Caribbean can be time consuming, and this is because there is a lack of financial resources which reduces the opportunity for us to produce cutting edge and high quality consist consistent studies. Next slide, please. So how can research help build back better? Research allows us to possibly examine the problems that exist and provide a solution to questions which are useful for policymakers, governments, and the community at large. In the context of the Barbados national response, I do believe that it was related to research on a global and regional level from WHO and PAHO and based on the daily surveillance and articles composed by the UEKFL COVID-19 Task Force. And I've put those links within the notes. Hopefully the work that was done by the COVID-19 Barbados KBP team reported to the Ministry of Health and Wellness will also be helpful to inform interventions or future policies. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a list of persons I'd like to thank and some honorary mentions, including ATC for the opportunity and the amazing work that they have been doing. Thank you and very sorry for the disturbances um, during the presentation. No, thank, thank you, yeah, Eden, for uh, your presentation. I thank you. That conversation about research, the power of research. Uh, now I have a friend who does a lot of research in getting through um, in getting through and preparing for his presentations. And it's always amazing to see the wealth of information that's out there. And what's always um, pointing that stands out is the lack of research in the Caribbean. 
And I think you have made the point, and I think Tara foreshadowed it as well, that with this research, we can begin to create the change we need to see within our health systems. And this research hopefully can lead to stronger policies implemented by governments across the Caribbean and across the world. Now, our next presenter will give us a bit of perspective on this, um, Kimberly Benjamin. Uh, she's a law student at Hugh Whitting Law School. Um, now, Kimberly is passionate about health, she, human rights and social justice issues. Her passion has led her to work with the United Nations Development Program, the Pan American Health Organization, among others. On admission to the Barbados Bar, it is Kimberly's intention to be a champion for the rights of the vulnerable in society. And she's just going to speak to us a bit about that policy environment and the importance of it. Thank you, Pierre. Good morning, everyone. These Build Back Legacy conversations are so pertinent and exciting. Interestingly, the word legacy in law is used to refer to a gift usually of personal property, which is left behind by a testator, that is someone who makes a will and signs off on a will, and he leaves that to someone called a legatee or beneficiary. And so if I may use that analogy very, very loosely, because there are other elements which are pertinent for that to work, um, government, civil society, NGOs, private sector parents are the testators, and the current and next generations are the beneficiaries. And therefore the legacy which ought to be left behind is that of a strong policy environment for the prevention and control and management of NCDs. In this presentation, therefore, I hope to depict what that legacy might look like by explaining the role of a strong regulatory environment for the prevention and management of NCDs, government's obligations as it relates to international law and specifically the children's health rights and the necessity for um, implementing a comprehensive policy package and paying attention to the built environment. At the end of the presentation, I hope to give you some suggestions on how we can build that better. Next slide, please. The, okay, so the NCD risk factors and environmental risk factors, which are well known, can be modified by a strong regulatory environment. And this environment should consist of a suite of laws, policies, regulations, guidelines, and other measures. I've listed several of them on the right of the screen, but basically those measures should be evidence-based. We just heard about re research. They should be multi-sectoral in nature as well, and they should be cost-effective, like the 2017 WHO Best Buys. The measures should also be based on human rights and target the population as a whole. So a strong regulatory environment would therefore include a plethora of these measures, legal and other, um, other measures, and its role really is to create this framework within which government and private sector must operate and also give others in the society, you know, the ability to hold them accountable. Importantly, a strong regulatory environment would make it possible for the population to make healthier choices since those choices would then become the easier choices to make in society. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to put this example on the screen because the Chilean law of food labeling and advertising is wide reaching and it addresses front of pack labeling, the banning and sale of unhealthy foods to children in and around the school compounds. And so, what is interesting is that in a 2020 study, which I read about, it showed that such sweeping measures had a greater impact on behavior and, than a standalone or single policy, such as just a SSB taxation. And to my mind then, um, this evidence is that a strong regulatory environment made up of comprehensive and wide reaching measures, is pertinent to the prevention and management of NCDs. Next slide, please. Okay, so like the Chilean government, other governments must recognize their international obligations, particularly regarding children's rights. And this can be found in Article 24 of the Convention of, on the Rights of the Child. This is an international treaty which has been ratified by all CARICOM member states. And it says that state parties should recognize, must recognize the rights of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health. Part state parties should pursue full implementation of this right. Next slide, please. 
The state's role, therefore, is explained further in general comment number 15, in which it is stated that the states should address childhood obesity. They should limit children's exposure to foods high in fat, sugar, salt. They should regulate marketing and control the availability of these substances, not only in the schools, but also around the schools. And so the, in, in international human rights law, the duty of states is threefold, to respect, to protect, and fulfill the aforementioned rights. And an undoubtedly CARICOM states must seek to do so by implementing a comprehensive policy package. Next slide, please. Thank you. So although some progress has been made, CARICOM states have been slow in the implementation of a comprehensive policy package. Only a few, and they're on the screen to the left, only a few have developed and implemented SSB bans in schools. And even then, the bans are on the sale and not on marketing. So the, there are limitations there. Then only even fewer, three out of the 20 CARICOM countries have imposed taxation on SSBs. And even then, the, the level of, of taxation is at 10% in two out of the three cases. And that has been shown, again, by evidence to be not, you know, the best. 20% is usually seen as the best. And so there are lots of limitations um, in the approaches which CARICOM governments have adopted. And there is scope for improvement in terms of developing a, real, a, a truly comprehensive policy package. I also wanted to highlight here some, I also wanted to highlight here that there are risks, of course, and there are opportunities, and governments will weigh those risks against the opportunities. In particular, the conflict of interest risk is one which persons in health are well aware of and, and need to become more aware of, I would suggest, um, because there we have very influential players like big industry and even key persons within society who have platforms and who persons follow on Instagram and social media and who, who can influence um, the policy space. And so it's important to protect the policy formulation process from such players. Next slide, please. And here with this slide, it's just to highlight as well the importance of the built environment and, and that it should feature in a comprehensive policy package. This is due to the real impact that the, in, the environment has on physical activity, access to healthy foods, mental health, as we heard about earlier, and climate change, which in itself has direct and indirect impacts on the health of the population. And so what is critical to appreciate here is that including the built environment within the policy package has additional benefits for the state in terms of meeting other sustainable development goals, such as SDG 11, which is on sustainable cities. And so there, there are multi-benefits -benefit, which can be obtained. Next slide, please. And so as I draw to the close of my presentation, I wanted to just highlight some suggestions on how we can build that better. I start with the youth, the beneficiaries to this legacy. Because as, as we heard in the earlier presentations, we do have a voice and we can influence change. We may seem like David, but we're actually Goliaths in our own rights. And so we deserve better and more meaningful representation and we ought to demand it and we ought to just go ahead and get it. Um, in terms of the government, the government is the main testator in this whole thing. With the stroke of a pen, the government can really, truly leave a lasting legacy. And so I would suggest that the governments should consider implementing a comprehensive policy which addresses not only COVID-19, but also NCDs. Uh, governments as well must look at training, um, providing opportunities for greater um, legal exposure in terms of the drafting of such policies. And you know, this one is really low line because a lot of persons have developed home gardens during their lockdowns. And there is something that the governments can think about in terms of incentivizing those home gardens. As it relates to CSOs, civil society organizations, they must continue to leverage the narratives of persons with living with NCDs and to advocate for NCDs to be included in the COVID-19 national response. And academia, and this is important again from the first presentation, education is powerful. And so how we teach programs can determine, you know, the outcomes for, for young people and, and they take those into, you know, across the life cycle. And so if we teach law that is all embracing, 
in all embracing, then health in all policies won't be conceptually difficult as those persons go out into the workforce. Thank you very much. Uh, right. No, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kimberly, for uh, that presentation. I particularly enjoy that one. Um, because actively in Barbados, we are still working towards a comprehensive school uh, nutrition policy. And you did underscore the important points that everyone on this webinar, I think, should appreciate and fight for in your individual countries, which is comprehensive policies um, that address the specific areas that need to be targeted to protect our children. And we've made the commitments through you know, the rights of the child. We've made the commitments nationally. It's just for governments to enforce them and enforce strong and comprehensive policies. Now, the discussion this morning, I think, was absolutely brilliant. And I um, had a tremendous time just going through it, listening to these um, uh, presentations, and I hope you did too. And we kind of started uh, this morning with Edith saying, you know, we have the power as society to change and fight for that, um, you know, better nutrition system, health systems, and equality. And I think just going along the thread, we saw um, a conversation on mental health. And I think Tara painted a very nice picture about what we in the Caribbean can realistically do to ensure that our young persons are protected, to ensure that, that our young persons do have the access to these resources. And she then shares some statistics and research that some were new to me, and I think that helps to build our case. Um, and I think even when we went to um, Jian, who had a conversation about how we need to protect our children in the tobacco space. Now, predatory marketing is something that not only happens with big tobacco, but fast food industries, other industries, they target our young people specifically so that they can continue those unhealthy practices. And Kedi, I think, thank you again for just showing us that perspective in Haiti and how persons living with NCDs are and can be adversely affected by emergencies, by crisis. I mean, we're in the middle of the hurricane season in the Caribbean. And again, these persons may be at risk of more vulnerabilities and disruption to their access to healthcare. Um, research, 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 research. That builds our case. If we can show that it's because of these numbers, one in three Caribbean children, if we can show that's because a certain percentage of young persons are exposed to tobacco marketing, if we can show the research behind our calls to action, that can drive our message. And hopefully with that research, we can create that strong policy environment that Kimberly just so brilliantly put to us. Now we will head into our question and answer section. I hope you've been sharing some questions. Uh, we hope this is an exciting area. Um, Danielle? Yes, Pierce. So per fantastic summary and excellent presentations. I just have to echo your comment on just them being brilliant because that's what they are. And I, again, do you see the power of the youth voice? Excellent job. And so I have to commend all of you for sending in your questions at registration. So we're gonna answer a couple of them. So I'll actually invite all of our panelists or presenters to come on and we're gonna, I'm going to feed them some of the questions that you would have asked. And then if we have some time at the end, we'll answer some of the questions. So I'll invite all our panelists to turn on their cameras and we'll get started. So Kimberly would have just spoken to the importance of, hello everyone, comprehensive policies needed to protect the most vulnerable. And so Edith, I'm gonna pose this question to you. So we know that the food and beverage industry in Mexico has been known to use pervasive strategies to market to children. And we are seeing very similar uh, situations right here in the Caribbean region. So from your perspective, how have obesity prevention policies like sugar sweetened beverages, front of package labeling, um, school-based regulations really address the inequities in access to healthy foods? Uh, following with, with the, the way we work, I'm going to turn the question to your audience. What will you think of a child drinking a beer? That would be I mean, if you see a baby in their baby milk bottle instead of milk having beer, what would you think of that? Well, we see that with sodas all the time, with sweetened beverages all the time. We see young mothers giving that. We see poor mothers 
giving that to their babies because of their lack of education and lack of understanding. So we need to think, and when we think about the fast food industry and when we think about like all this lack of regulation, yes, and this and that, but we think we need to think about what, what's happening in our homes. And like, I totally agree with all the, the measurements that are being taken. Definitely for Mexico, the, um, what's being, um, the taxation of, of sweetened beverages and also the front labeling of the packages um, in Chile, that is our model for now, the, the policies that, is, that are being in, uh, pushed in Mexico. It is definitely a battle because the, the food industry is a giant and it's really, it feels like, <laughs> it feels like the story you were saying about, it feels like Goliath, really, um, but it is not. Um, and so when we start taking back our power and when we start seeing where our money is going, um, we know that we have the power to change that because we are giving them our money. Um, and that's the only thing that they can control, really, um, if we are or not. That's why their marketing strategies are so powerful. And that's why they're trying to sell us happiness, which, of course, we're not going to find with their products. Um, so we need, to, we need to take that into accountability, like the power that we have. Uh, as individuals and as consumers. Um, in, in the other aspect, when we think as a society and when we talk about the government and, and the schools and the policies and all these things, um, that it's re definitely there's action being taken. Um, it is not enough. Unfortunately, it is not enough. And that's why we need to continue doing this type of work. That's why we need to continue advocating we have been told that we have um, the power to choose. And that is what I'm trying to give you as a message. At the same time, we live in the environment that we live in. As, as John said before, it's pushing on us and it is teaching us from a young age what, what they want us to think that we can choose. We, le we live in an obesogenic environment that is not allowing us to make better decisions. We're seeing in Mexico, indigenous communities adapting their ceremonies with now these sweetened beverages, and now that's a religious practice for them. That is absolutely unbelievable, and we cannot accept that into our communities. We need to get into those communities and teach them better. But it is not only because they have chosen to use that. It is because their water is scarce and because they have no other way to hydrate themselves or hydrate themselves, what they think. So we have, there's, I see two aspects for them. When we see our children in the schools, we need to think about this environment that, that, that has been creating and how in every single corner in our cities, we can find sweetened beverages and we can find packaged foods that are not good for us instead of finding fruits and vegetables that we should find in every single backyard of, our, of ours. Um, or at least that's how I see the world that I want to create when we're building back together. So I'm just going to leave that to question ourselves to what extent are we able to choose and our choices that we make every day, how, how much are they really our choices and not the industry that are telling us that, yes, you can choose between this or that and taking back our power because we're, we're voting with our money every time we buy something. Excellent, Edith. And you brought up so many, so many really pertinent points. And one of them is that supportive environment, right? And so if we think about the community and leveraging the community in this multi-sectoral approach, Eden, I'm going to pose this question to you. So your research focuses on community initiatives. How do you think community gardens can also address nutritional inequities? Okay, um, I believe that this question should be answered in the context of food insecurity in relation to the four dimensions of food security. So nutritional inequities exist due to inaccessibility, unavailability, instability, and simply the lack of use. Um, inaccessibility is most likely linked to poverty or lower socioeconomic status. However, community gardens would allow for the sustainable availability and geographic and economic friendly access of particular nutritious foods such as 
fruits, vegetables, or grains to all in the community. So community gardens, they can be supported by governments or NGOs, or maybe um, even taken up by with permission. members of the community and they may have some families that may not be able to contribute financially to materials they can still contribute um, to the planting maintaining or harvesting so added to the fact that it addresses issues um, that cause nutritional inequities is the fact that it allows for community engagement and a sense of ownership which is critical to sustainability and additionally it increases physical activity. And this may tackle the double burden of under or overnutrition. And this is just one of the approaches that could be used to address nutritional inequities. Excellent. Thank you, Eden. Um, yeah. And again, so remember, we're thinking of this whole society, multi-sectoral approach. We've looked at policy. We've also looked at, you know, that community, leveraging that community, support and engagement. And Again, we're looking at prevention as well as management of NCDs. And so if we're looking at treatment, because that's something that we have to focus on with NCDs, Kedi, I'm going to pose this question to you. How can the health sector ensure the continuity of NCD screening and other preventative measures in the era of COVID-19? We have seen that... Um screening and treatment for NCDs have been disrupted everywhere. And the people most affected by this situation are all the people living with NCDs who are the, the poorest people. Um, in this uncertainty, we cannot ask them to come to clinics or go to laboratories to have tests and all this. What we can do is prioritizing community approach. Train young people, send them in the community to maintain medication supply chains, and um, train young people to give better education to people living with NCDs, to other people living in the community, for them to know what NCDs are and how to take care of, of people living with this disease. And like I said um, before, we are not, um, we have, we do not yet have the technologies for, um, for telemedicine. But I think it's one of the, one of the biggest tools that we can use um, for education and to assess patients to, um, to know who should have the priority and um, how to take care of them without telling them to come to the, to the clinics. Excellent, thank you, Kedi. So again, leveraging what we have in the community, but also considering how can we plan for the future in making this sort of treatment care accessible for those who are particularly vulnerable. And so again, when we're looking at multi-sectoral approach, I think at this point we've recognized the importance of health and having to integrate, or the need maybe to integrate health into different components of our society. So on that point, um, Kimberly, if we could discuss really what health and all policies is, because that might be something new for some people, but it's something that's almost like a gold standard and what the benefits are. Sure. So health in all policies is really a collaborative approach to policy making. Um, it is where the health impact is considered of various policies, not necessarily policies which originate within a, a Ministry of Health, but um, the impact of those policies on the health of the population. And it is a it's not a new concept, but it is still one which has not necessarily been utilized, but which ought to be utilized because of the benefits and the core benefits that exist from a health and all policy approach. Um, there are a number of ways in which it can be done. Um, 
there's, of course, the whole of government's approach, which I think is the best approach, especially for us, um, our small island developing states, which may have limited budgets and limited human resources um, to truly implement it. And so having um, a whole of government approach where there is continuous collaboration across ministries is, is very useful. And practically, this may take the form of um, a task force, you know, a multi-sectoral task force um, with players from the various ministries. So health ministries, transport and works, um, education, agriculture, all working together, um, yes, on their ministry goals, but with health in mind and, and with the health perspective and the impact in mind. I think as well, yes, the Ministry of Health should perhaps take a leading role on such a task force because of the, the, the genuine impact on, on health, you know, from the built environment that I would have spoken about during the presentation as well. Thanks, Kimberly. So again, a realistic example of what this can look like. And so Pierre, I'm actually going to turn it over to you to speak with Tara about something that I know you are super passionate about, and so I'll leave you two to it. Yeah, um, Tara, um, as anyone at Healthy Caribbean Coalition can tell you, mental health and any conversation around mental health is something that I am particularly passionate about and always happy to have a conversation on. And I think just going off of what Kimberly spoke about in terms of uh, policies and comprehensive policies, the World Health Organization, they actually moved towards that um, just a couple years ago by moving from their four by four model to a five by five model to include mental health. Now, over the pandemic period, over the lockdown, uh, many children and adolescents spent more time online and are spending more time online. Um, and this is becoming a realistic concern for a lot of persons, parents, teachers, governments. Um, there is that possibility of exploitation of uh, predatory marketing being exposed to them. Um, how do you think that this can be addressed in the Caribbean within the context of protecting children and their mental health within that online space? That is an excellent question and I'm glad you asked it. I think one of the positive outcomes we can take from this global pandemic is that it has brought to light a lot of areas that are already existing concerns, particularly within the Caribbean much like our healthcare industries and the, the concerns that we have there. But this is one of the areas where I think we have needed to address and because of the pandemic and the switch to online life, it's become particularly important. So it's difficult to regulate what children and adolescents are exposed to online. And it's very important to keep in mind that as an adult or a parent or a teacher trying to control the access of what a child interacts with online is likely to break down some trust and cause the child to to act out or not want to share with you what's going on but i think it's particularly important especially for a parent with a child who switched to online schooling to not just monitor what they're engaging with but be mindful of how they react to their online presence so if you see a child that spends more time online and is increasing their their space in the online sphere and then when they come offline they seem to be distracted or withdrawn or anxious then at that point i think it's particularly important to engage with them directly and ask them, how are you feeling and what is it that's making you feel this way? What about the online space is making you feel unsafe? And collaboratively work together to find a way to create the online space that they need for learning and socializing, but also make sure that they feel safe and secure in that space. And also, I think it's very important that when they come offline, particularly now with online schooling and everything that we do being much more virtually interactive, it's very important now more than ever to make sure that they have a strong social support system in person. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I think, again, it underscores our commitment or what should be our government's commitment to protecting children and the rights of the child, because it is their right to be protected even in that online space, within their schools, within their environments, from predatory marketing, from any type of unsavory behavior. Um, and in continuing that conversation about youth, children, creating that safe space for them, whether it's online, in person, in healthcare. Um, Jeanne, I'm just going to pose this question to you in terms of 
we want young persons to be involved in advocacy. We want young people to be involved in the conversation on health. We want them to inform the policies that affect them. How then can we provide or how can governments provide an improved space for meaningful youth participation in the management of health systems? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pierre. This is, I think, the, the question of the day. <laughs> it's the hardest one. Um, I think we can start by giving uh, young people a chance because the chance to fail, the chance to try. Because uh, what I got was I got that chance. Actually, I was facilitated not by my own generation, but by the previous generation who realized that we should not be only the passive part of this issue, but also the active part of this issue. So I was given the chance, I was given the chance by my chairperson to speak at a press conference when she know, acknowledged we are talking about youth, but there's no youth there, so you should speak there. So it takes one door and then two doors and then others or doors are opening. So we, we got to give them a chance, I think, to to fail, to try, you know, to to at least, um, you know, experiments because we all, we all have the innovations. We are, I, I'm sorry to say, but we are the digital native and the previous generation are digital immigrants, if I may say. So because we are we we're born in this era, we know how it works. So we, we should be given more chances to, to actually exercise our freedom to, to campaign, to advocacy. Uh, and, and actually I'm speaking from experience here because one, one of the example was our research with fellow children forum from 13 cities in Indonesia. We, we, we tried to look at um, the, how tobacco industry uh, markets uh, advertise around schools, how, how, uh, how cheap the prices are compared to the pocket monies. First, people mocked us. What kind of methodology are you using? You know, and something you're not expecting a Lancet uh, level of research from young people, but you are expecting them to have this hands-on experience. And then, basically, our research ended up being used by the Minister of uh, Women Empowerment and Children Protection, and later by the Ministry of Health to actually create a program, national program that actually enforces that if you want to be called a child-friendly city one of the requirements is to, for you to, to ban all together all kinds of tobacco advertisement, promotion, and sponsorships. So that's just one story, but I think this can happen throughout um, the region, I think, also throughout Caribbean, we can, we can try this. Because as long as we're given a chance, as long as there is someone, just someone who, you know, to, to, to show us the door and let us, you know, open the door ourselves, not just spoon us, spoon fed us in the mouth, but you know, to actually involve us in the making of the recipe, even not only when, when it's cooking or when it's done, you know. So, so I think it's it's the point. I think I think um, Pierre has been a good example. I, I met you, Pierre, at, at Sarja at the Global NCD Alliance. I think Caribbean has a very bright future in in youth advocacy and in campaign. So, yeah, I have all faith in you. <laughs> um, thank you, guys. I think this. This conversation today, I mean, it warms my heart. <laughs> I think um, this is something that we have all been talking about for a while, bringing young people together from across different perspectives and spaces to have a single conversation about youth involvement, youth engagement, meaningful youth participation in a health space. Um, and as we close, I just would like to thank very much our speakers today. I think this is just a brilliant example of the power of youth and the power of the youth voice. We have a Caribbean representation. We have Jian from Indonesia, a part of this. We have um, Edith from Mexico, a part of this conversation. And we see that we all have shared experiences and shared issues um, in terms of protecting our children. And we also see that we have shared solutions in finding you know, the response or the right response to ensure that our children inherit a better future. Um, and again, the ACC team, I'd like to thank you all for your support um, in putting together this webinar and having this conversation today. Um, Prof, we thank you for coming on. Uh, we thank you for having this platform for us. And all of you attending, we thank you for your questions as well. I saw a lot of conversation going on in this chat, chat box and some of our presenters actually responding and we thank you for that. We hope that after this conversation, we have provided some resource, provided some information to help you and help others build back better. Um, you can look out for more uh, youth focus opportunities and more conversations from the Healthy Caribbean Coalition about youth, youth engagement, meaningful youth participation, and how youth advocates can leverage their voices for policy change and uh, for the change you want to see in your countries and in your regions. All right, so if Daniel, you don't have anything else to say, I don't know, do you? Okay, great. So um, thank you all for joining us today. We do hope to continue this conversation. Keep in touch with us. You can follow our newsletter and we hope to see you at our next webinar.